Launched in February 2005, the Amazon Prime membership plan came as a wrecking ball to American retailers. It single-handedly raised the bar for convenience in online shopping and it provided an alternative to the immediacy of brick and mortar stores. As of 2018, the service had 100 million paying members across the globe and gave Amazon a market share in e-commerce of more than 50%. And now, Amazon Prime has set foot on Brazilian soil. With continental size and subpar infrastructure, the Brazilian e-commerce market has proven to be somewhat of a tough nut to crack. So today we are asking, will Amazon Inc. be as disruptive in Brazil as it was elsewhere? My name is Ewan Marshall, editor of the Brazilian Report, standing in today for editor-in-chief Gustavo Ribeiro, and this is Explaining Brazil. Natalia Scalzaretto, hello. Hi, Ewan. So, it seems like everyone in Brazil is talking about Amazon Prime. Have you jumped on the bandwagon? No, at least not yet. How about you? Uh, Well, I seem to remember signing up to the Prime Video service a while ago to watch some old Seinfeld episodes, but I think that makes me a Prime member now, right? I don't know. Uh, For our listeners who aren't familiar with the service yet, can you you explain what Amazon Prime entails? Uh, So for a monthly fee of $9.90, you get free shipping and purchases on Amazon.com and access to their streaming platforms with TV series, movies, music and books. It actually costs about five times less than it does in the US, which is in line with Amazon's traditional strategy like push prices very low in order to gain market share. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos has always been able to convince investors that they will lose money in the short term, but that will eventually pay off as Amazon swallows up the competition. Well, speaking of competition, what has been the the impact of the launch of Amazon Prime for the company's domestic rivals? At first, it set off a state of panic among investors, like major Brazilian retailers like Magazine Luiza, Via Varejo, BDSW and Lojas Americanas saw their combined market cap fall by about 5 billion reais in a single day. But then, once the dust settled, their stock value recovered. Uh, it also helped that the official data on retail performance in Brazil was better than expected, which partially made up for Amazon settling into the Brazilian market. Yeah, and this isn't Amazon's first foray into Brazil, is it? Amazon has taken its time to establish itself in Brazil. They actually first came here in 2012, but it took five years for the company to allow third-party vendors to sell products on Amazon.com.br, the Brazilian version of their marketplace. And then, at the end of last year, Amazon launched a distribution center, which allows it to control its production chain from end-to-end. And now, its main product, Amazon Prime, is here. So just going back to what you said there, why why is it important to have end-to-end control? Well, it reduces costs. If you think about it, without control over all the parts of your process, you have to work with third parties, you have to rely on other services like the Brazilian Post Office, and that's complicated. Uh, Magazine Luiza is a good example here. It has a large fleet of its own trucks, and this has allowed it to speed up its deliveries a lot. So, Natalia, as someone who has been following this sector, how is this all going to end up? Like, Do you think Amazon will just end up swallowing up its Brazilian competition, or is there maybe a chance that domestic players can actually remain strong? That's the million-dollar question. When you talk to investors that are Two theses. Some believe that as the population becomes more tech-savvy, e-commerce will grow exponentially and Amazon can become a huge threat. Others say that there's more than one Brazil to look at. When it comes to the countryside, brick-and-mortar stores remain super important as something of a tradition, I would say. Not to mention that Brazilian retailers can use strategies like click and collect, which Amazon wouldn't be able to do as an e-commerce company. Exactly. Like I can say from experience that you can go to the farthest flung corners of Brazil and you will still find one of these stores selling washing machines and what have you. I just I can't imagine Amazon being that bothered about dominating that side of the market. Can you? 
I guess that Amazon has been adopting a watch and learn approach to Brazil, which is wise considering how bad other firms, giants like Walmart, have done. Even if they see the countryside as a market opportunity, they will study it carefully and take their time. Then it's up to the locals to step up their game and use their home field advantage. Yeah, and in Brazil, retail goes far beyond just e-commerce. More on that next. Hi, my name is Lucas Berti and I work at the Brazilian Report. Do you like the Explaining Brazil podcast? Then please rate our show on whatever platform you may be listening to. And don't forget to share it with your friends and co-workers. Many people write us asking how they can support this show. The best way is by subscribing to the Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. You can enjoy a seven-day free trial and subscription plans start at only $3.90 per month. That's cheaper than drinking two lattes a month at Starbucks. Go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. With the rise of the internet, people around the world have dramatically changed the way they shop. In Brazil, it's no different. But while the country is starting to adapt to e-commerce... Local shopping habits have made retail a bit of a puzzle, even for local companies. Facing logistical challenges and with the Brazilians' love for bright white air-conditioned shopping malls, companies are still trying to work out what is the best-selling formula for the Brazilian public. And to make it worse, they're having to do this while the country is recovering from its worst economic crisis on record. For a glimpse of what we can expect for the future of Brazilian retail, we reached out to Guilherme Dietzi, a special economic counsellor at FECOMERCIO, which is the Federation of the Sale of Goods, Services and Tourism. Guilherme, retail has been taking longer than expected to recover from the economic crisis. Do you see that as an effect of the crisis itself, or has there been a change in Brazilians' consumption habits? Uh, both ways. Uh, the e-commerce has a lot of uh, space for, for growth. If you think about uh, the comparison between e-commerce and retail sales in Brazil, the ratio is 2.7 percent, while in in the United States, 14.3 percent. So we are changing during the past decade uh, and uh, still growing the e-commerce. And I think and I think uh, we have more space to grow uh, in the next years. Brazilian e-commerce still has a reduced market share in comparison to other countries. In your view, what are the challenges the model faces to becoming widespread in Brazil? First of all, I think it's logistic. Uh, we still have like a, a long, a long way to go. If you compare to Europe or United States, uh, we have the monop- monopoly of the Correios, the the mail company that's uh, for the government. So we still have like a long way. Uh, not not even uh, really logistic. We are talking about tax. Every state has their own tax uh, complex system. So the companies, uh, they, they feel a little not comfortable uh, to, to s- expand the sales on the Internet because of these this problems. If you think about uh, sen- uh, sending a package from Sao Paulo to Manaus, uh, we cost a lot of money here in Brazil. So we need to reduce this cost to, to improve the e-commerce in Brazil and to have this ratio. Uh, more uh, close to the developed markets. The population here in Brazil, they are not used to e-commerce. They are getting used to the these new f- uh, forms of uh, consumption. So if they think about consumption, they go to the physical market, o- offline market. So uh, I would say, yes, uh, Correos is one of the one of the issues of for the increasing of the e-commerce, but the, the the, the structure of the families, they are very conservative of, of, uh, when we talk about uh, consumption. So we've seen online events such as Black Friday and Cyber Monday, we've seen them become increasingly important and they've brought some important innovations to retail, especially you know in the way that they advertise. 
But would you say that the strategies adopted for these one-off days can have an impact on retail for the rest of the year? Yes, absolutely. It's changing. Uh, if you think about Black Friday, it's changing the, the, the behavior on the second semester of the year. We have the biggest month is December because, of course, of the, the Christmas sales. Uh, but we are increasing the participation of November in the retail sales. So Black Friday and also the, the Cyber Monday and another events there occurring in uh, November are increasing the sales in November. So the, the strategies are changing uh, on, on retail. So it's a good thing. We are not uh, we are not in the same situation of 10 years ago that uh, only the, the retails they, they were waiting for Christmas. They were waiting for like Mother's Day. Uh, they are creating new uh, new days and new events during the year. So then can uh, have more sales, revenues during another month that's considered not good as uh, December, for example. Some retailers use so-called omni-channel strategies, which is like click and collect services, which integrate your physical store with your online store. And how important is it for companies to invest in these as business strategies? It's a good way to, to, to open your market and a new strategy to get more revenue. So they're, they're, the companies, they don't stop in the same situation. They are increasing their revenue with an omni-channel uh, marketplace. So it's a good way to, to improve the business, to get more revenue and uh, have more cost, uh, uh, customer on your online store. In countries such as Japan, you know, we see many stores adopting a kind of self-service approach using software, mechanical tools, things like that. Do you see stores in Brazil following the same path? Not in a short term. We have in Sao Paulo in some cases, you have some stores like uh, I would say like between 10 to 20. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't say like that, that we will happen in Brazil for the next two or three years. Of course, everything will change if you think about five to six years. But here in Brazil, uh, if you think about technology and a self-service, uh, I would say that would not happen uh, shortly in, uh, in our economy. And would you say that Brazilians still prefer to deal with other people or do you think they're kind of ready to deal with that technology? Uh, they're ready to deal with the technology, but they, they are a little bit afraid of technology. Uh, if you think about online market, for example, they are really afraid to to give the credit card number on a uh, if you purchase online. So uh, th- there are some some things that can improve in the uh, consumption behavior that uh, will help the online service and then uh, also the self service. Uh, service, but I think that will change in the long term, not in the short term. So nowadays, shopping malls in Brazil, they work as something of like an entertainment center for families in big cities. Do you think that they're going to start focusing more on attractions like movie theaters, arcades, that sort of thing, as opposed to, you know, stores? I think this is the way, you know, to keep going the the, the, the sales on the, super, uh, on the malls. Uh, I went this this weekend on uh, on a mall here in Sao Paulo, and I saw like many many kids like playing a, a specific space. There are like a, a bunch of th- 30 to 40 kids play, uh, playing some games. And, uh, and while the family are shopping and uh, having dinner or something else, I think this is the way to keep the family together because all, also we have like a, a for safety reason as well. So the family used to go to the malls because it's more you have security inside and you can leave the, your kids with the entertainment uh, uh, spot. Also, you can go to the cinema. Uh, I think that the malls are like improving this uh, service systems, ser- service pro- uh, uh, products that can uh, improve not only the, the service, but also the, the retail revenue as well. And what about these concept stores that have been popping up in Sao Paulo, like a kind of different purchasing experience sort of thing are they really working or are they just a marketing strategy i think they're uh, making this only for marketing uh to increase the online sales or something else i don't think that we work in a long term uh, we have this in sao paulo in some neighborhoods where the the high income yeah, as you see the the families the rich families they they go for example here at jardins itaim bb for example 
uh, you don't see like in any other malls or places there in Sao Paulo, like a Zona Leste is a, a little bit far from the center of the city. So it's a, I think it's a market thing for like a, some specific uh, type of customer for a higher income. Guilherme, thanks for joining us. This podcast was prepared by Gustavo Ribeiro, who wrote the episode along with me, Ewan Marshall, and Natalia Scalzaretto. Natalia also produced this show, and I was in charge of editing the final script. If you like this podcast, rate us on any platform you may be listening to Explain Brazil. It just takes a second, but it is really important for us. And make sure to visit our website, brazilian.report, and enjoy our free trial for seven days. And it's really free, you don't have to submit any credit card information whatsoever. So just go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. You can also support independent journalism by donating any amount to the Brazilian Report. And you can go to brazilian.report slash donate. And if you want to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, our handle is at Brazilian Report. And that's all for now. We'll see you next week.